Let's go to 1 Samuel 16. 1 Samuel 16. I said the first uh, week after the Labor Day weekend, on Wednesday night, I will begin a series on the life of King David out of the Old Testament. This will take me about a year on Wednesday nights. And uh, tonight I, I want to do uh, a, a brief introduction. Um, before I do that, I want to read where in the Bible David is introduced to us. And that would be first. Samuel chapter 16, verse number 1. And the Lord said unto Samuel, How long wilt thou mourn for Saul, seeing I have rejected him from reigning over Israel? Fill thine horn with oil uh, and go. I will send thee to Jesse, the best of my might. For I have provided me a king among his sons. And Samuel said, How can I go? If Saul here, he'll kill me. And the Lord said, Take a heifer with thee and say, I'm come to sacrifice to the Lord. And call Jesse to the sacrifice. And I will show thee what thou shalt do. And thou shalt anoint unto me him whom I name unto thee. And Samuel did that which the Lord spake and came to Bethlehem. And the elders of the town trembled at his coming and said, Come thou peaceably? And he said, Peaceably. I'm come to sacrifice unto the Lord. Sanctify yourselves. Come with me to the sacrifice. And he sanctified Jesse and his sons and called them to the sacrifice. And it came to pass, when they were come, that he looked on India and said, Surely the Lord's anointed is before me. But the Lord said unto Samuel, Look not on his countenance or on the height of his stature, because I have refused him. For the Lord seeth not as man seeth, for man looketh on the outward appearance, but the Lord looketh on the heart. <coughs> Seven is one of the classic passages in all of Scripture. Verse 8. Then Jesse called the king of and made him be passed before Samuel. And he said, Neither hath the Lord chosen this. Then Jesse made Shema to pass by. And he said, Neither hath the Lord chosen this. Again, Jesse made seven of his sons to pass before Samuel. And Samuel said unto Jesse, The Lord not chosen me. And Samuel said unto Jesse, I hear all thy children. And he said, There remaineth yet the youngest. And behold, he keeps the sheep. Samuel said unto Jesse, Send and fetch him, for we will not sit down till he come hither. And he sent and brought him in, now he was ready, and with all of a beautiful countenance and goodly to look to. And the Lord said, Arise, anoint him, for this is he. Then Samuel took the horn and anointed him in the midst of his brethren, and the Spirit of the Lord came upon David from that day forward. So Samuel rose, rose up and went to Rome. That was his home. Now, this is how we are introduced to David in the Bible, and uh, he is the most eminent type of Christ in the entire Bible. Definitely yeah, in the Old Testament. There are two or three things that I'm going to say about way of introduction. And then uh, I want to talk about David as a boy before this story. Now, these are things that he did and said later about his youth life. But first, I, I'm going to read Hebrews 1, verse 1 and 2, and make an explanation. Hebrews 
1, verse 1 and 2. Here we have the most affirmative and positive statement that God wrote the Old Testament, and the Old Testament is divinely inspired. God, who at sundry times, talking about the Old Testament, and in divers manners, visions, dreams, direct revelations, spoke, spake in time past, in the uh, Old Testament, unto the fathers, the Jewish people by the prophets. Hath in these last days spoken unto us by his Son, whom he hath appointed heir of all things, by whom also he made the world, who being the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person, and upholding all things by the word of his power, when he had by himself purged our sins, sat down on the right hand of the majesty on high. The clearest, simplest, easy to understand word from the Holy Spirit that both the Old Testament, verse 1, and the New Testament, verse 2, are the inspired word of God. The Bible is about one person, the Lord Jesus Christ. The Bible has only one Agenda, subject, the unfolding of God's plan of redemption for fallen man. It began in Genesis 3.15. It ends in the last chapter of Revelation. Now, that plan in the Old Testament moved mostly very slow. It took a giant leap in the life of David, but it took a final <laughs> outfilling when Jesus Christ came to earth. And then the clearest most complete exposition of God's plan of redemption for fall of, for the, for the, from the fall for the fall of man from the Romans. When the Apostle Paul is given by the Holy Spirit <coughs> that book on justification, how do how can you declare a guilty sinner righteous? Which leads me to remind y'all, starting Sunday, I will begin preaching through the book of Romans. <coughs> so, be ready for that. So the history of God's plan of redemption of fallen man really encompasses the entire Bible. Matter of fact, uh, Paul said something about that in Galatians 4, verse number 1. Let me just read it to you. Now I say that the heir, as long as he is a child, giveth nothing from the servant, though he be Lord of all, but is under tutors and governors until the time appointed of the Father. Even so we, when we were children, were in bondage under the elements of the world. Paul is talking there about the Old Testament people and how they were being taught little by little by little by little by little about God's plan of redemption. Um, for example, in Genesis 3.15, uh, the uh, serpent will bruise the woman's seed, heal not a fatal wound, but the seed of the woman shall bruise the head of the serpent, which is a fatal blow, which is a picture of Jesus Christ on the cross, by the way, defeating Satan. So we learn that. Uh, then when Abraham came along, we learned that it was, he would be the father of the
the physical Jewish race and also the father of the spiritual spiritual Israel, all believers, Jews or Gentiles. And then under Moses and Aaron and the law, we learn all about the priesthood and sacrifice, the whole book of Leviticus. Every bit of that is a foreshadowing of Christ. Let me tell you something, when the Lord Jesus Christ got here in the flesh, the Jews were absolutely without excuse. Because they had years of the Old Testament in symbols and types and shadows. They were absolutely without excuse. And by the way, in Romans chapter 2, Paul really takes the Jews apart. Oh, they're on the but that's for later. So we have all these adumbrations in the Old Testament. But when David came along, things really stepped up. Let me just give you some examples. He is, I said, the most eminent type of Christ in the Old Testament. Through David, we learn the tribe that Christ was going to come from, the tribe of Judah. Through David, we learn the family that Jesus Christ was going to come from, Jesse. Through David, we learn the man that Christ was going to come from David. Through uh, David, uh, we even learn the town <coughs> that Jesus Christ was going to be born in. Micah 5 2, Bethlehem. Literally, in, in David, you have the unfolding of the kingdom of Christ. <coughs> Let me. Uh, just read you a few, uh, few verses uh, to make my point. Uh, Isaiah 11, 1. <coughs> Let me read you Isaiah 11, 1. And there shall come forth a rod out of the stem of Jesse, and a branch shall grow out of his roots. That is Jesus Christ coming out of the family of David. Uh, turn to uh, I, I, Jeremiah 23, verse number 5. Behold, the days come, says the Lord, that I will raise unto David a righteous branch, and the king shall reign and prosper and shall execute judgment and justice in the earth. David was a type of that. His kingdom was a type of that. But the ultimate fulfillment is in Christ. And by the way, this one gets future. <coughs> this one gets future. Then let's go way to the end of the Bible. Last chapter. I'm not sure I got the right word, but I'm going to look at it and hope I do. Yeah, 16, Revelation 22, 16. I, Jesus, have sent mine angel to testify unto you these things in the churches. I am the root and offspring of David and the bright and morning star. So, David is important because the primary subject of the Bible is God's unfolding of the plan of redemption for falling, for falling mankind. Now, there's another thing. And by the way, next week, uh, no way we're going to get there. Next week when I get into the text that I read out of 1 Samuel 16, there is so much there. We'll, we'll be there a while. But... Briefly, the story that I read. Jesse had eight sons. Seven were called. Now, when, when, when Samuel came to eat at Jesse's house, that's like Billy Graham coming to your house for lunch. The most prominent, feared 
and respected spokesman for God of his time. And so seven of the sons were called to the meal, but David was left out. First of all, he was the youngest. He had no chance, David had no chance of advancement or inheritance or progress in that family with seven old sons in front of him. Secondly, David loved to keep sheep. David loved to sit under the stars, watch the sheep, write poetry, and strum on the guitar and sing songs. David was the different one. So he was not invited. They did not want him in there until Samuel made them, made them bring the boy in. There's a principle in the life of David and in the Old Testament that's really important that I, I, I want to point this out and, and make a modern application to America today. David was the least likely in human eyes. But the very one that everybody thought, oh, not him. We don't even need to call him in. The luck is the one that God said, that's him. It's a really important principle. Um, even in Jewish family law, the kingdom should have gone to the oldest. God overpassed that, went to the youngest. In Genesis 3.15, when God made that great prophetic promise, about the seed of the woman. He made it after man had rebelled and the world plunged into sin. The first covenant of human government was made after Babel, after the confusion of tongues, after the flood. All of the promises of God's covenants in the book of Deuteronomy were made after Israel's complete <coughs> apostasy. When God sent Samuel to David's house, it was after the period of the judges when Israel, the nation, had, had fallen into total disrepair. The one verse that describes Israel at the time that we're talking about here is Judges 17.6. In those days there was no king in Israel, and every man did that which was right in his own eyes. It was under those very bad religious and political and social circumstances that God spoke. God always came at the right time when man had reached his extremity. And God always has a man somewhere that he will produce at the right time. Now I want to caution us as believers in America today, you know, while I'm here teaching there or doing the political forum with Mr. Trump and uh, Mrs. Clinton, <coughs> I would be cautious about writing things off. Because things have been a whole lot worse than they are, than what we think they are right now. And God came to the rescue. 
I would be careful about doomsday prophecy. I admit it looks like it. But you don't know that as bad as things look, that God doesn't have a man somewhere that he will yet produce. We don't know that. And I'm going to tell you something else. We as believers, we're in the world, but not of the world. We're not a part of all that. Uh, we're here to be a witness for the Lord Jesus Christ. And who knows what God may yet do? Because in the Old Testament, over and over and over, when things had gotten so bad that it looked like there was no hope left, God stepped up. When man was at its worst, when the, the Jewish state was at its worst, when human, when human race was at its worst, God stepped up. And we need to remember that. Because who knows what God may yet do. God always came at a time when man was absolutely in a state of hopelessness. Now, David, as a youth, uh, before 1 Samuel, uh, chapter no number 16. First of all, we know that God said, He is a man after my heart. And uh, what is said, go back to uh, 1 Samuel, chapter number 16. <coughs> is said in verse 1, And the Lord said unto Samuel, How long wilt thou mourn for Saul, seeing I have rejected him from reigning over Israel? This is a consequence of what happened in chapter number 15, where God, where God had sent Saul and his army to destroy the Amalekites. Everything, save nothing. And of course, Saul disobeyed. And Saul saved the wealth and some of the best stock for sacrificing. And so the Lord, through Samuel, said to Saul, Why have you not obeyed me? And Saul said, Well, I have obeyed you. And Samuel. Uh, mocks him and says, well, if you've obeyed me, it's all the bleeding of these sheep that you're supposed to kill. And he said, well, I've saved them to sacrifice to the Lord. And that's when Samuel made that famous statement. He said, uh, obedience is better than sacrifice. For rebellion is, as, is, as, is at, as the sin of witchcraft and idolatry. And because you have disobeyed the word of the Lord, the Lord has rejected you from being king. That's the circumstances Dave gave, Dave, uh, David came out of. So right here, and the Lord said unto Samuel, How long wilt thou mourn for Saul? Samuel loved Saul right up to the very end. There. But I have rejected him from reigning over Israel. <coughs> Now, there's a Bible principle there. You know, from the time that God rejected him, it was quite some time before, you know, Saul finally just kept going down, down, down. Finally, he went to a witch uh, to, uh, and said to the Lord to get counsel. And then finally, he and his boys died in battle. He, died, he, died, he really died a very terrible end. Uh, from such a good beginning, such a humble beginning, he died. Really, such a terrible end because he got proud and he, and, and he uh, went against the Lord. So, verse one is a consequence of all that. Sometimes there's some considerable time from the time that God gives up a person or a family or a church or a religious organization or a denomination or even a country. 
sometimes from the time that God gives them up to their actual demise is some considerable time. And we don't always know what that time frame and what that <clears throat> time frame is. For example, God, uh, God, Jesus Christ on earth said to the, to the uh, Jewish leader, your house is left unto you desperate because you rejected me. And of course they killed him. But that temple that he was referring to stood for 40 more years until about 70 AD when the Roman army destroyed it literally fulfilled what Jesus said, not one stone was left on another. Now, has God done that to America yet? I'm not ready to answer that. I know a lot of people are really ready to answer that. Yeah, I admit it, it doesn't look good. But we'll see. So, David's heart, the heart of the whole thing to begin with, for the Lord seeth not as man seeth, for man looketh on the outward appearance, but the Lord looks on the heart. Question is, what does God see when he looks at our heart? God does not care what you look like. God does not care if you're big, tall, skinny, uh, a lot of hair, no hair, white hair, gray hair. God doesn't care if you're teeth come out in light like the stars. God doesn't care about any of that. God cares about your heart. What does he see? See, all the sons that Samuel said, oh man, this, this is good. God, uh -uh. God didn't care what they looked like. God looked on their heart. What does God want out of our heart? Deuteronomy 6, 5, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, and with all thy mind. You see, God's children are different from the children of the world. God's children are different than all the children of the world. We have the Spirit of God in us. We've been saved, washed by the shed blood of Jesus Christ, redeemed, justified, Declare the righteous, set out on a walk of sanctification for the Lord. We're not like everybody else. We're different. Here's a principle I'm not going to get near as far as I thought. I'm going to read something in a minute in closing, but I'll just have to wait to do this next Wednesday night. One, two, three, four. There are four Old Testament scriptures that give us a spiritual insight into David before, when he was still 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15 years old. There are four Old Testament passages that show us why God picked him. From the divine side, from God's electing side, God did that before there ever was a world. You understand? God understood. God knew. God ordained everything before there ever was a world. But there's a human side. There's always human responsibility. So we just have to wait till next week to look at the life of David to see what it was about him that God liked. And of course, obviously, that will be a lesson for us how we should conduct our life through this world. Let me, let's go to 1 Corinthians chapter 6. No, 1 Corinthians chapter number 1. 1 Corinthians chapter number 1. Here's what God says about believers. Verse number 26. I'll read you again. 1 Corinthians chapter 1. Verse 26. <coughs> For well, you see your calling, brethren, how that not many wise men after the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble are called. But God has chosen the foolish things of the world to confound the wise. And God has chosen the weak things of the world to confound the things which are mighty. And base things of the world, 
and things which are despised have God chosen, yea, and things which are not to bring to naught, things that are. That is a perfect description of David when God called him. That dreamer, oh man, we don't even want that kid at lunch. That's the one God wants. Why? That no flesh is glory in his presence. But of him, of God, who picked you, are you in Christ Jesus, who of God has made of his wisdom. If we don't have any wisdom of our own, the wisdom we have is God's wisdom. Righteousness. You and I have no righteousness. The righteousness we have is God's righteousness. And sanctification. The road that we're now walking is by the Spirit of God and redemption. And why does God operate that the way he operates, and why did God work with David the way he worked? That according as it is written, he that glorieth, let him glory in the Lord. Listen, everything God does in your life and my life is so that he So, um, boy, I really wanted to get that far, but this, I need 30 minutes just, so I'll do that next Wednesday night, uh, the conditions of this boy's life, human speaking, that God gave him. And then we'll be ready to work our way through that life, and I think it probably takes about a year to do that, Lord willing.